so I've contemplated telling this forever because it sounds so not real, but I've decided to share it anyway. When I was in high school, I worked at the local Pizza Hut, and I was a closing server. After closing down the salad bar and mopping everything up, I got out of there pretty late at night. I had this ritual of texting my dad when I was almost done to let him know that I was almost home. Mostly though, it was just a test to see if him and my mom were awake or not. If they weren't, I would take the long way home on the old country roads. I lived on a dog breeding farm about 20 minutes outside of town. I would take the extra time to smoke a joint or two and jam out. One particular night, I decided to do this. I was going down a back road about three to four minutes from my house. This is a road I know very well. My school bus took me down this road my whole childhood, pretty much. One thing to note about my area is that I live in the deep woods of East Texas, so most people who own property put their houses about one-fourth to one-half of a mile back on it. They keep their exposed woods as basically a natural fence. While you can see a lot of driveways and mailboxes, you can see almost no actual houses, just woods with random chunks taken out. As I'm going along, I come upon a toolbox, like the ones that sit in the back of work trucks. It was smack dab in the middle of the tiny dirt road. I pulled up to it and stopped. I opened my door, stepping out but not far away from my car. As I took in this strange obstacle though, I realized my headlights were not the only light on the road now. There were other headlights, smaller ones, coming up a driveway that was parallel with the toolbox. I sat back down in my car and closed my door until only a crack was open. In a moment's notice, I could shut it and go off into the grass and get out of there. All of a sudden, a small riding wheel lawnmower comes out of the trees. Riding it was a man in a full clown suit and a mask as well. He had a shotgun laid across his lap. He turned and looked directly through my windscreen, into my eyes, and then aimed his shotgun right at me. Now, I'm a country boy myself through and through, and I can tell when I'm somewhere I'm not wanted. Before he could do anything else, my car was already in drive and in the ditch on the side of the road. I got out of there, threw my joint out, went home, and crawled into bed. I never spoke about it again. I don't know what that guy was doing, seeing as this was probably 2018 or 19, so well after that whole killer clown craze. Whether it was just a dumb kid trying to scare someone or a crazy backwoods man, I'm not quite sure. When I was a kid, my family moved into a house in the suburbs of Ottawa, Ontario. It was a pretty normal residential neighborhood, with houses on each side of the street. There was one neighbor that stood out from the rest, though. When my dad went to introduce himself, he immediately got a very strange vibe. She barely spoke and wouldn't open the door more than just a crack. She seemed very secluded and shy, and she refused to give her name as well. We ended up just kind of calling her the crazy lady. One day, I was playing outside with my brothers. We were having a lot of fun, when suddenly we got this overwhelming feeling that someone was watching us. I tried not to think about it too much, but then I began to hear a knocking sound on the window from the house across the street. I looked over at the crazy lady's house, where she was standing in front of her window watching us play in our driveway. We made eye contact for a moment, and I quickly looked away, wondering why she was just standing there watching us. I was also wondering how many times she might have done this, and we just hadn't noticed before. I went inside and told my parents, but they said not to worry. The woman seemed harmless enough for now. It seemed, though, that every time we went outside, I would notice her standing in her window. She never smiled or waved. She would just stare at us. 
The only time she would ever speak to us was when a ball or something else we were playing with rolled up to her driveway and we had to go fetch it. She would come outside and almost immediately start yelling at us and telling us to get off her property. Fast forward about five years and my neighbor finally disappeared. It was as if one night she just decided to up and leave. No one in my family was sorry to see her go, but even when she left, that was not the end of it. One night, not long after, we heard sirens outside our house. The fire department and paramedics had all gathered outside the crazy woman's home. My mom went over to them and tried to explain that the house was empty, but they responded they had received a call from a medical alert necklace at that address. We all went back to sleep assuming something had gotten mixed up and they just ended up at the wrong address. Eventually, a new family moved into the house. We all went over to introduce ourselves and we got to talking about the woman who used to live there. They seemed very confused. They told us that they had owned that property for many years now and no one, at least according to them, was supposed to be living there. Eventually, through their oldest son, my family and I learned two things later on. Upon re-entering the home, there had been a single chair facing the window in the front living room, and no one could remember having left it there. Second, down in the basement, there was a small room, more of a storage space really. It was locked from the inside, and the family could not access it. The parents never remembered it being locked, and they didn't find the key. To the best of my knowledge, they never got access to that space. I couldn't help but wonder, even years later though, if perhaps the remains of that old woman were down there behind that locked door. I have a faint memory of being involved in the Rodney King riots back in 1992. I was only seven at the time. We had originally been stacking empty beer cans in my friend's fenced-in backyard when the commotion started. We heard a lot of yelling and cursing and police sirens, even loud pops, which I didn't understand at the time were gunshots. We all wandered over to the chain-link fence and watched the rioters up the street. They were shouting, breaking windows, getting into fights with cops and other random pedestrians. I have no recollection as to who was babysitting us that day, but needless to say, they did a piss-poor job. My friends and I actually left the enclosed yard and wandered out into the street to get a better look at all the chaos. We were completely oblivious to the fact that what we were watching wasn't just a show, and one of those stray bullets could have easily killed us. We would watch two people fighting from a safe distance, then something else would catch our eye. As this happened, we became more and more separated from the backyard area. One of my friends then witnessed a shop being looted and asked us if we wanted any candy. He was a bit older, maybe around 11 or so. He crossed the street and peered through the broken glass, apprehensive about going inside because of all the infuriated adults around breaking things. I eventually got separated from all my friends. Most of the memory is a blur. I remember at one point getting scared when I realized I didn't recognize anything around me. I ran into an alleyway and crouched down in fear. I remember watching as a cop took a corner pretty hard and smacked a man over the hood of his patrol car. A group of other men rushed the car before the cops could get out and started banging on the windows. In the alley across from me, I saw three or four other men pouring gasoline into a dumpster and lighting it on fire. I remember finding it so fascinating, seeing a fire burning in something other than a fireplace or a ring of stones. I watched the fire grow bigger and bigger, completely oblivious to the world around me. I wanted to look closer, but I was too scared to move from where I was. There were so many people running around doing crazy things. I even remember one woman who walked past me down the alley. 
she came up to me and kissed me on the forehead and said, God bless you, child. Head yourself home. Before I could even respond, she was gone. She lit a cigarette and disappeared down the alley. I didn't know how long I sat there. Maybe 20 minutes, maybe longer. The dumpster fire was still raging and growing bigger. I continued to watch it. The next part stands out the clearest in my mind, though. A man in a green and white windbreaker turned the corner into the alley. He saw me and grabbed me by the shirt collar. He reeked of smoke, sweat, and gasoline. He might have been one of the men from before who started the fire in the first place. I can't be quite sure, though. He started dragging me across the road towards the dumpster fire. He was cursing and swearing at me, and I began to panic. I was suddenly afraid he was going to toss me into the fire. I could see the flames coming closer and closer. I wasn't sure if that's exactly where we were heading, or if we were just going in that general direction, but I squealed and kicked in protest until he pulled me into a headlock and cut off my air. When we got to the far side of the street, I could feel the heat of the fire on my face. Suddenly, a bigger man grabbed the man holding me and threw him against the wall. He began punching him in the face over and over. I remember staggering to the ground and watching in horror as the bigger man pressed my kidnapper's face to the side of the dumpster. The man screamed louder than I ever knew a human could scream. I remember the smell of burning meat. I took off running down the sidewalk after that. Everything after is mostly blurry. I remember tripping, falling down, and another woman picking me up and telling me to go into the church and sit down. I must have sat there in the pews for a long while until someone finally recognized me and brought me home. I don't remember the exact details. Surprisingly, I was mostly unharmed, aside from a few scrape marks. One of my friends had to be rushed to the hospital, though, after someone had thrown a TV out of a high window and the glass hit him right in the face. He turned out to be okay as well, though. I don't know if that bigger man came to save me or if he just had some beef with the other guy who grabbed me, but I often wonder what happened to that man in the windbreaker. Sometimes I wonder if that bigger guy killed him after pressing his face to the side of the scalding hot dumpster. Seeing a fire calls that memory back. I could be watching a movie and see a bonfire in the background, and that scream will just echo in my head. Considering what could have happened to me, though, I think I got off pretty lucky. I live in a dirt cheap housing complex in Detroit. Last year, I was in the process of moving in. I hadn't even been there for two whole days yet. It was around 11 o'clock at night, and the majority of the house was dark because I hadn't even plugged in most of the lamps yet. I was upstairs in the smaller bedroom, hanging up some clothes, when I heard the front door open downstairs. The door was old and warped, and once it was fully shut, you had to really fight to force it open, twisting the knob as far as you could and putting your shoulder into it. It wasn't locked, mostly because I figured there was no point. It might as well have been locked anyway. No one was going to bother trying to break into this old, decrepit place in the first place. I stood up and walked out into the hallway. I looked down into the dark living room below. I could hear someone rummaging around in the kitchen where I had left my phone and laptop on the counter. Figuring it was my friend who came back because she'd forgotten something, I called out. Hey, Patty, is that you? Silence from downstairs. Now, I consider myself to be a pretty tough person, but I can also be extremely reckless. I yelled out in anger and stormed down the stairs, convinced that someone had just wandered into my home to rob me. I grabbed an umbrella I left on the stairs, ready to wield it like a sword or a bat. There was no thought in my mind about what would happen if the intruder had a gun or if there was more than one of them. When I turned the corner into the living room and looked into the kitchen, though, there was no one there. I stood still for a moment and just listened. 
The only light on the ground floor was coming from the single lamp I had plugged in by the stairs. There was enough light though to see that there was no one there. Deciding not to let my guard down though, I took three careful steps forward, my umbrella raised and ready. I turned my head to look at the far side of the kitchen, where the pantry is. Right as I did so, the pantry door swung open softly. It wasn't completely closed, so when it opened, it barely made a whisper of a sound. The man who stepped out from behind it looked me dead in the eye, and I nearly fell to my knees from terror. Beneath the man's hood, his face looked almost pasty. He had melted skin, as if he had been burned in a fire. It was stretched so thin across his skull that it almost looked like a layer of cellophane or something. His mouth was also equally horrific, and his nose was barely more than a lump below his eyes. Both of his eyes were open so wide they looked as big as light bulbs. I dropped my umbrella and took a step back. I was petrified. In that moment, I'd somehow convinced myself this was some kind of demon ready to drag me down to hell. The figure had my laptop and a container of cold turkey in his arm, though. In his other hand, he held an ice pick that was pointed at my face. He muttered in a slurred voice that he was leaving, and just like that, he power walked out of my living room and into the night. I fell to my knees on the kitchen floor and tried to catch my breath. The man was not physically large or imposing. In fact, he was shorter than I was. The sight of his face caught me so off guard, though. My insides turned to ice water, practically. From outside, I heard a car horn and the squealing of tires and the sound of someone yelling. I crawled over to the door, intending to just slam it shut, but then I noticed the headlights of a car stopped in the road. The container of food was splattered all over the ground, and my laptop was right beside it. A man climbed out of the car and cried out for someone to call the cops. Some idiot had run right out in front of his car in the road, and he'd struck him by accident. It took the police close to an hour to arrive, and of course by that time the intruder was gone. I was sitting on my front step wrapped in a blanket and smoking a cigarette when the cops came over. I described the man's face as best I could, to which the cop asked if he looked like a burn victim. He said he knew exactly who that was, and they would look around for him and check the hospitals just in case he was badly hurt. They said his name was Marvin, and he had been trapped in a burning car when he was a kid. Now he was homeless and mostly broke into cars looking for valuables to pawn. I didn't go out onto the street to collect my belongings. Honestly, I felt kind of bad, like I'd just deprived a man of the only meal he was likely to get that night or in the foreseeable future. It crossed my mind that when he had been trying to hide in the pantry, maybe he was more scared of me than I was of him. I never found out what happened to him, but I do hope that he's okay and in a better place now. When I was 17, I worked on my grandfather's horse ranch in Colorado. This was way back in the late 80s when throwing the football around and drinking were all there was to do. At least when I wasn't out cleaning the barn or feeding the horses. At the time, both my father and grandfather were well known throughout the community as being upstanding people. It seemed as though everyone who encountered them in town was on a first-name basis with them. As a result, that also made me well-known during social gatherings as well. I don't remember the exact date, but I think it was late November or early December of 88. I was horseback riding deep through the backwoods with my cousin Roy. It was the furthest we had ever traveled back into our family's property, and we were enjoying the sensation of exploring a new place. I was focusing mostly on the compass, because I didn't want to get lost. Roy, though, was scanning the tree line for new landmarks, and anything interesting worth investigating. I wasn't really expecting him to find anything, though, so I nearly fell out of my saddle when he pointed out what would appear to be an RV. 
parked out amongst a cluster of trees. We made our way over towards it on the horses and discovered it to be one of those old-fashioned truck RV campers that had its own power supply. It wasn't really parked on a dirt road or anything. It was more an open avenue between the trees, just wide enough to fit through. I had no idea which direction the closest road was. My very first thought was that it had to be abandoned. The closer we got, though, the more obvious it became that this vehicle was in pretty good shape. Almost new, I would say. I stepped down off my horse and knocked on the door. I was curious to know if someone was actually living out here on our property, therefore trespassing, or if it belonged to one of the two dozen or so people my grandfather knew from town. Most likely, I would know them as well. After knocking several times, I tried the handle to discover that it was locked. Now, the practical thing would have been to note our position, head back home, and ask our family if they knew what it was. But we were teenagers, and we had no common sense. We wanted to explore further. We went to the far side and discovered the opposite door was cracked open. I pulled it halfway open and peered inside. The first thing that hit me was the smell. It was like a wave of burnt bacon mixed in with stale tobacco. Roy jokingly asked me if I found any bodies in there. I peered around a bit. It was late in the morning and the sun was high. Even though there weren't any lights on in the camper, I could see well enough by the light peeking in through the cracks in the window blinds. There was a small couch, a small table, some ugly carpeting, and about three different ashtrays. Hello? I called out. I stated my name as well. After a few moments of silence, I concluded no one must be there. I peered my head further in to get a better look. I saw a tiny kitchen area with a sink countertop and cabinets. I was about to pull my head back out when I noticed something. One of the cabinet doors was ajar, and I could see something large and bulky was preventing it from shutting completely. I stared at it hard. Then I walked out into the woods and found the longest stick I could easily carry. I walked back over. What is it? Roy asked. I didn't answer him though. I carefully extended this stick into the camper. After a few close scrapes on the cabinet door, I managed to knock it open a bit wider. My stomach sank and my heart started racing. I pulled the stick back and turned to my cousin. What does that look like to you, in the cabinet there? I didn't tell him what I thought it was. I wanted to see if he identified the same thing I did. Roy peered inside and stared for about three seconds. Fuck, I don't know what it is, but what do you think it looks like? I insisted. Roy stayed silent for another few moments, then jumped back from the window. Holy shit, is that someone's head? Like a human head? I peered back in again. The thing in the cabinet definitely looked like someone's head lying on its left ear, facing the back of the cabinet. All I could see really was the dark hair in the right ear. I couldn't see the neck very well. It was still out of sight behind the cabinet door. Come on, there's no way that's real. Roy tried to laugh it off. I wanted to agree with him, but the cold pit in my stomach was not letting me. Something about the hair had that disheveled look and the skin was too realistic. There was this rotten meat smell from inside as well. Well, what else could it be? I remember asking Roy. I wanted him to say something ridiculously obvious it might have been, but he only shrugged. I picked up the stick again and stuck it through for a second time. I wanted to physically poke at it so I could get a better sense of what it was. I leaned in as far as I could and caught the cabinet's edge with the stick then tried to swing it further open. That's when a cold hand grabbed my arm and knocked the stick out of my grip. I only remember the next few moments as a blur. All I can recall the feeling of was an intense shock and jerking of my arm backwards. I caught the glimpse of a bare chest, a bearded man as well. I wrenched my arm back as hard as I could and was surprised when he let go of it casually. The thing that made me most horrified in that moment, though, wasn't seeing the man's face, 
but catching a glimpse of what appeared to be a second person's head on a shelf at the far right side of the camper, just over the man's shoulder. I yelled at Roy to run to the horses. We both mounted up and rode out of there as fast as we could. I recall hearing the camper door swing open hard and the sound of a rifle being fired. We didn't look back for several minutes until we were in a familiar area. We then slowed down and changed direction. As we made our way back to the house, Roy and I immediately encountered my father coming down the stairs. We sprinted inside and told them everything possible. The decapitated head and all. I'll never forget the look on my father's face. He didn't seem surprised or alarmed, only annoyed. He told us to get the horses back in the barn and that no one was to call the police. He would handle it himself. With our adrenaline still racing, Roy and I returned the horses to the barn and made our way back to the house. My dad made us wait in the living room for our grandfather to come home. When he did, the four of us sat down at the dining room table and had a long talk. My grandfather looked us both dead in the eye and said if we ever spoke about this to anyone, we would be denied our inheritance to the ranch. We never discussed it again beyond that point, but Roy and I still talked about it plenty. We even went out there a week later to see if the camper was still there. It was gone, though. We followed the wheel marks for over three miles of bush and leaves. We tracked it to a dirt road where we lost the trail. My grandfather died in 2003, and my father recently passed away of heart failure earlier this year, making our inheritance firmly secure. So, I finally decided to write about this experience, because the memory has been haunting me for years. Roy and I speculate that my grandfather and father knew the man that was out there. Maybe he even had their permission to be there. When we stumbled across him and he shot at us, though, everything changed, and he was driven off the property. Had my father just blown it off and told us we were crazy, I may have slept better that night, but the fact we were threatened into silence made me think the matter was deadly serious and maybe those heads we saw were real. I feel in my bones that my family helped shelter a dangerous man and potentially cover up his crimes. I feel something may be unearthed one day that will really come back to haunt us. So my house was on a big chunk of property in the tri-state area, about 108 acres. It was originally kind of a park area, but it wasn't supposed to be used like that. Unfortunately, people from all over didn't get the memo we had moved in, and therefore continued to party, hunt, and fish wherever they felt like on our property. Over the years, the problems began to go away, except for a couple. In fact, there were four particular men who kept coming back and hunting in the middle of the night. We let some people hunt on Saturday nights here and there, but for the most part, hunting was off limits in this area. We were never able to catch these four middle-aged men, though. They always wore these masks that looked like pig masks. These men were sneaky and smart as well, and that's what made them so terrifying. I had three different encounters with them. The first one was in June of last year. A few friends and I had decided to go on an adventure through the woods, and we discovered something quite frightening. We found a fortress covered in beer cans with a chair at the top. Being teenagers, we decided to of course do the smart thing, which was to destroy all of the hunters' hard work on our property by kicking the entire fortress down. Boy, did we mess up by doing that. We returned later to that area to check up on things, and that's when it got scary. It was rebuilt almost like a shrine to the last one, and spray-painted on the ground was, Try that again, we dare you. The second encounter happened during a simple walk at night. Sometimes when I get upset, I like to take walks through the woods. This time was at night, like I mentioned. It just so happened our favorite hunters were out hunting that night. I was walking along minding my own business when I see a man in a pig mask out of the corner of my eye. He saw me and now knew my face. I heard a deep laugh as he turned his gun towards me. 
I had no idea what he was planning, but I booked it out of there ASAP, so I didn't have to figure out what it was. My third encounter was the most blood-curdling, and occurred only a few weeks ago. I was walking home from my cousin's house in the dark. I had my flashlight shining, and I felt safe, but something was off. The barn lights were on. The barn lights were never on. No one ever goes in the barn. The floors in there were practically falling through. I simply brushed it off as a technical error. Then, though, in the middle of the field, I saw the man with the pig mask. He saw me, and his words have haunted my dreams since. You get the hell out of here before I make you! The way he said it, the intonation of every word, he was angry and vicious, dead set on revenge. I haven't been in the woods since then. It was later discovered they had been setting up shop in that barn for some time. They haven't been found yet and I doubt they ever will. This happened over a decade ago. I was living alone in a ground floor apartment. Everyone had gone to bed for the evening, but I was never a good sleeper. Laying down around 12 and getting to sleep around 2 was as good as it gets for me. Actually, I had been asleep when I was suddenly jolted awake by a crash from the next room over. My apartment was kind of a large open complex with the doors open directly to the outside, not like a big connecting building. It was in a nice neighborhood and usually very quiet, especially at night. I could hear from my bedroom well, so the crash just ripped through the complete silence. I had two cats and at first assumed they must have been chasing each other around and accidentally knocked something over. I started to get up and scold them, but I couldn't even pull the blankets back all the way because I found they were both laying on top of it huddled together against my hip. They looked terrified, with huge dilated eyes and their ears pinned back flat, puffed up like they'd been electrocuted or something. They were not easily frightened, and I'd never seen them like this before or since. That bothered me even more than the noise. Anyway, as disturbed as I was, I was actually getting angrier and angrier that I'd just been rested from a restful sleep. I went out to investigate without a thought for my own safety. I armed myself nearly naked and marched across the room and up the hall to the kitchen in the dark. I then flipped on the light. I almost wish I had found a burglar there. My kitchen was small. There was about eight feet between the sink and the stove. I kept a dish drainer rack sat on the folded dishcloth next to the sink. When I went to bed that night, there had been a ceramic bowl and a couple pieces of silverware and a plastic food storage container in that area. Now, it and all of its contents were scattered at the foot of the stove. The dishware was all broken as well. The dish towel had also made it halfway through the area and lay directly in the center of the kitchen floor. I wasn't angry anymore now. I was more just confused and suddenly very aware of how late it was. I also knew I had to try and get up for work in the morning. I picked up the dish rag and set it on the counter nearest to where I stood in the entryway. I collected the rest of the mess and heaped it up inside the rack, then shut off the light and returned to my bed. The cats were still huddled and looked over again. I remember laying down and falling back into a fitful sleep for a few hours before waking up in the morning, hoping I had just dreamed the whole thing. I found the dish rack and the mess right where I'd left it though. I didn't find any signs of any intruders or anything, so I'm not really sure how that happened. I don't like to ascribe such things to the supernatural like a poltergeist or something. I consider that very lazy and childish. I'm sure there's some rational explanation, but I've never been able to come up with one, and neither have the few people I've told about this experience. Nothing like that ever happened again after either. I'll never forget the way my cats looked towards the kitchen when they heard the crash, so scared. I've long since given up actually trying to figure out what happened, 
but if you have any ideas to add, well, I'm certainly listening. This happened when I was 14 or 15. My school had this option where if it was too far away for you to travel to school, you could stay in a hostel nearby. You would pay a certain amount monthly, and on alternate weekends, they'd allow you to go off to see your parents. This was an all-girls school, and we experienced a change of guards a lot after the previous one passed away. The late guard was a nice chap, he acted more like a grandfather to us than anything else. He was in his late 50s or early 60s and would always bring us food from his wife and various candies. When he passed away, one day a man in his 30s took the guard's post. After quite some time with the hostel being without one, the new guard was a bit off. There were times he would just walk past the study room and just stare through the window in at us. Other times, he'd stay outside the gate near the shower room smoking cigarettes and trying to peek inside. It creeped us out a little, but we couldn't really do much. The wardens were also wary that we wouldn't be able to get a new guard at all if they fired him, and we'd have no one to protect us whatsoever. So, he stayed. Whenever he was around, we got uncomfortable. Usually, we'd just close the door to the room we were in so we couldn't peer inside. Fast forward a few months, and our panties started to go missing. We had this place right behind our hostel block that was allocated for us to hang our laundry to air and dry. Some girls would soak their clothes in softener for the night and leave their clothes, including panties, in a pail in the laundry room. The next day, we would wake up and all of our undergarments would be missing. The girls went home for a few weeks. We were all getting anxious about the missing underwear. It came to a point where so many went missing, a few girls were only left with one pair. They had to give their parents an emergency call to buy them more and send it over to the hostel. The wardens were getting quite concerned as well. We alerted the school and local law enforcement, but nothing was being done. We were left to our own devices. One weekend, two girls went behind the guardhouse to grab some cleaning stuff. We cleaned up part of the hostel on alternate weekends when we didn't have any outings or anything. They noticed a large garbage bag. They left it untouched at first, but when they went to return the brooms and mops, one girl was curious to find out what was in this bag. She decided to take a look inside and inside that bag were the heaps of our missing panties. Both girls freaked out when they saw the young guard running towards them and screaming profanities. He yelled at them not to touch the bag. They both ran towards the main hostel building, straight to our warden's room. Our wardens were of course very alarmed and called the police straight away. Armed with a few burly girls who were on the hockey team with their sticks in hand, we went out looking for him. The guard, however, managed to escape on his motorcycle. A few days later, the police caught him snooping around our hostel when it was almost lights out. Turned out he was a repeated sex offender and had been caught a few times as a flasher around schools in the city. We were all relieved to have him locked away in jail, but also upset that our school had been so careless in hiring this guard for the hostel. Our parents demanded a PTA emergency meeting and decided that the next guard they hired had to be approved through the PTA first after various interviews. It's scary to imagine that this guy had the keys to almost all the rooms in the building except for the dorms. Only the dorm leader was allowed to have a key to those. Imagine what nasty things he would have done if those two girls didn't discover that bag of missing panties. After all, this man was entrusted to guard us from harm, but he turned out to be the very danger lurking around. I still get shivers down my spine whenever I think of him. So, I work in a pizza place, usually inside, as my insurance doesn't cover claims and driving for business. 
but occasionally I will cover a delivery shift for one of the drivers because the money is pretty good. Our delivery area includes a few new development to upper middle class cookie cutter neighborhoods. There's also an older 1940s era village, two apartment complexes, some trailer parks, and a bunch of rural areas. They were rural enough to the point that you could see hundreds of stars at night out there, and you probably couldn't hear your neighbors yell either. About a week ago, I was covering a delivery shift, and I came back to the shop feeling pretty good. I was averaging $5 a delivery, and they had all been pretty close by. I checked to see if we had any more available. I did have one to an address I'd never been before. We have mostly semi-regular deliveries, so an address that didn't seem the least bit familiar was somewhat odd. It was out on one of the more rural roads. I asked the kid who took the order what was up, because there were special instructions on the ticket. He said to go around back because the front door wasn't operational. I'm like, okay, well, it's not that uncommon people want you to go around back. Either they just painted the door or the house shifted a lot, or maybe they were just hanging out back having a party. It wasn't that weird. As I was driving out to the house, though, I started to get this odd feeling. I didn't really like the idea of going around back of some house way out in the sticks. It would be all too easy for some thugs to order a pizza to an abandoned house. And there were quite a few of them up in these more rural areas. Then they jumped the delivery guy. I figured I'd scope the place out when I got there, and if it seemed sketchy, I'd just call them and make up some bull about how it's against company policy to go around the backs of houses to prevent robberies or something. As I'm driving to this address, I realize towards the end of this road, it started to get less and less populated the further down you went. Great. I was now close to the address and driving slow, when I see this abandoned looking house set way back from the road, no address on it at all. It was surrounded by a bunch of woods as well. I thought to myself, man, this house better not be it. I drove past and checked the next house's address. Lo and behold, the abandoned looking one was the right house. At this point, I wasn't super worried. Out in the boonies, the standards of upkeep on your house are pretty low, so a house in disrepair but still being occupied is not unusual. I doubled back to this home and pulled into the driveway. At this point, though, I was getting some seriously bad vibes. Something was not right here. I parked my car at the very end of the driveway, with the rear of the car on the shoulder, so anyone passing by could clearly see it. I called back to the shop and told them this house was way sketchy. If I didn't call back in four or five minutes, call me, and if I didn't answer, call the police. While I was on the phone, I took the chance to get a good look at the house as well. It looked extremely abandoned, not just in disrepair. The driveway was crumbling into bits of gravel, and there were weeds growing out of every crack and crevice. There was no mailbox, no trash cans, no car, no lawnmowers, no landscaping, absolutely nothing in the yard, and the yard looked like it hadn't been mowed in years. The house was total crap. The roof was all wood and falling apart. The siding was falling apart. The back deck, which came around the side, was falling apart. The only part of the house that looked even a little bit decent, in fact, was the allegedly non-functioning front door. The windows were all shut. It was 95 degrees and humid, and this place doesn't have AC either. All the blinds and curtains were shut, and the few that weren't were actually boarded up. I couldn't even see any wires running through this house. It wasn't dark yet, but it was dusk. There weren't any signs of lights on. At this point, I was starting to get pretty nervous. I'm a 5'10 male, 180 pounds, and not in the greatest shape. I did take self-defense classes for 10 years, so I'm not quite helpless, but I don't like to have any sort of confrontation. I'm mostly a pacifist. I'm not too concerned about getting robbed anyway. No skin off my back. It's not my money. I mean, I'd rather not, but I was mostly worried about getting jumped and killed. It's a fairly safe area, but there had been some rather unsavory people moving in from the city. 
there had been a big spike in home invasions and robbery. Even more worrying, a few stabbings and assaults as well. It was time to either nut up or shut up. I was not going to go charging in there like a fool. I got out my phone and called the number they gave me when ordering. While doing so, I was also getting the pizza out and making sure to leave my door open and my car running half in the road. I was starting to walk up to the house while the phone was ringing. It rang twice when an automated message came on. It said something along the lines of, This phone is associated with an internet texting app. One of the free ones you can download now that lets you send free texts from a different phone number over a data connection. I think it was Haywire or something. We'd had some issues with people using numbers from those services for pranks in the past. This was a huge red flag. My heart was now pounding in my throat, and my whole body was telling me to bail right now. I'm just standing there holding this pizza, looking at this house and not wanting to venture around the back of it. I was hoping the resident would look out the window and come out to the road to get their food. I was also looking in the front windows, checking for any signs of life. That's when I see a blind go up, one on the window next to the front door. A really creepy looking guy, with his hat pulled low and big sunglasses on, was looking out at me. Remember, he was in a completely dark house surrounded by trees at dusk. There was no reason for him to be wearing sunglasses in such a situation. I could also see what appeared to be a big guy standing behind him in the room. When he saw me looking, he mouthed something and darted away, presumably toward the allegedly broken front door. I had stayed pretty close to my car though, so it was only a few steps away. I jumped into the driver's seat and threw the pizza into my passenger seat, something I would usually never do since I'm really anal about keeping my car clean. I slammed it into reverse before I even got the clutch all the way in. I grinded my gears a little, again something I never did. Without looking, I simultaneously slammed and locked my door and moved backwards onto the main road, slipping my clutch horribly. At this point, I didn't care though. I didn't even check for cross traffic, really stupid on my part. I started to drive away and looked back at the house. The screen door on the outside of the front door was now open, but the front door was still shut. The guy wasn't out in the front yard waiting for me to come back or anything. He just appeared to be gone. I pulled over a little ways up the road to call the shop and told them I was all good. I'd elaborate when I got back. People call back to inquire about their food usually, even if the pizza is only 15 minutes late. These people never got it, so it's really strange they didn't call to follow up. Pretty much confirmed they were up to no good. After telling my coworkers about it, we concluded it was definitely a robbery at the very least, so we put the address and phone number on a no deliveries list and ate their pizza together. I doubt I would have actually gotten murdered or anything. Maybe robbed with a gun or a little roughing up, yes, but it was still very unnerving. I could have easily gotten into some serious trouble just for doing my job, especially if these idiots had picked a slightly less abandoned house to set up at. Anyone who delivers pizza should be wary of situations like this. I looked into it and apparently it's a pretty common way to rob pizza guys. Halloween isn't my favorite night of the year, actually far from it, but I put up with all the decorations on my house and scary movies all October long because my wife Laura absolutely adores the holiday and I'll do anything to make her happy. Every year we hand out candy to the neighborhood kids. She and I dress up in cheesy couples costumes. It's very fun for her, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy it at all either. The neighborhood we live in is extremely nice. My wife and I are both lawyers and we do pretty well for ourselves. So when it was time to buy a house together, we made sure to get exactly what we wanted. On Halloween of 2009, Laura and I were dressed as Sam and Frodo from Lord of the Rings. She insisted and I thought it was pretty hilarious. We even dressed our little baby up as Gollum. 
We were handing out candy as usual, and seeing what all the kids in the neighborhood were dressed up as, it was pretty fun. We'd never had any trouble while handing out candy before, but this night would prove to be very, very different. At around 9pm, Laura answered the door, and instead of hearing trick or treat, she was met with a young boy, maybe 8 or 9, crying on our doorstep. She knelt down and was asking him what was wrong, but he wasn't saying much. In between sobs, he would say that he was lost and he needed some water. Laura tried asking him where his parents were, but he wouldn't answer. She brought him inside and took him back into the kitchen to get some water. She motioned for me to follow her into the living room, and when I did, she told me she was going to call the police. I told her that was a good idea, but we should also wait for the boy to calm down a bit, then ask him if he knows his parents' phone number as well. After our talk, Laura and I walked back into the kitchen, but the boy wasn't sitting at the counter anymore. He was standing at the back door. Both of us thought nothing of it. Maybe he just wanted to look outside. We sat him down at the table and asked him what his parents' phone number was or if there was anyone we could call to come and get him. He finally stopped crying and told us he didn't know his parents' phone number, but he did know his brother's. He made the call, and within 15 minutes, his brother was at our door, sweaty and obviously worried. He told us he'd been out trick-or-treating with his brother, looked away for only a moment, and he'd disappeared to who knows where. He thanked us more than he needed to, really, and we watched as they walked down the road out of sight. I mentioned to my wife how his brother looked nothing like him, and was definitely way older than 14, the age he said he was. We contemplated still calling the police just to tell them what had happened, but eventually decided against it. That was when our little golem baby started crying. We realized we already had enough on our plates. The boy was with his brother now anyway, and surely he'd be fine from then on. Laura was still worried though, so I spent the next few hours reassuring her everything would be okay, that we'd done our part already by helping the boy when he needed it. By midnight, my wife and I had laid down for bed with our baby in his crib beside her. Laura kept talking about how successful the night was, but she felt a little uneasy still about the boy we'd helped earlier. I had started to become somewhat irritated by her bringing it up, and I eventually just told her I didn't want to talk about it anymore, and the situation was done and over with now. Boy was I wrong though. At around 3 in the morning, my wife woke me up and told me she heard something downstairs. She felt like someone was in the house. Just as she said that, I heard what sounded like footsteps coming up the stairs. I whispered to her to take the baby into the bathroom that was attached to our bedroom and lock the door. I went into our closet and shut the door behind me. It took me a second to remember the code to the safe but I sighed in relief when I finally got it open. I took my handgun out and tried to stay as quiet as possible. I was hoping my wife had brought her phone into the bathroom with her and was calling the police right now. I opened the door to the closet, just enough to be able to see out toward the door that led from our bedroom into the hallway. I watched as a man in a really terrifying clown mask opened the door and came right into the room. He walked towards the bathroom and tried the handle. That was all I needed to see. I slowly opened the closet door as to not alert the man to my presence and pointed the gun at him. In a more shaky voice than I honestly wanted, I told him, Stop! I'm calling the police, so you need to leave right now. I don't think he realized I was pointing a gun right at him. He turned around very quickly like he was going to attack me or something but the second he saw what I was holding, he froze in place. My back was to the door, which was honestly a little stupid of me. I had assumed this guy was alone, but I quickly learned that was not the case. I heard someone clear their throat and tell me to put the gun down. I glanced in that direction the voice came from, and to my shock it was the boy from earlier, standing right behind me, pointing a gun at me. My mind was racing. I knew if I put the gun down, I'd have nothing to protect my wife and child. 
I always knew I would risk my life for my family, and I couldn't let them down by giving in to this man and child in that moment. I decided there was really only one option, and it all counted on one thing, that the kid wasn't as confident as he seemed. I shot the man right in front of me. As he collapsed to the floor, I turned around and tackled the kid, wrestling the gun out of his hand easily. Thankfully, I was right. I figured if I shot the guy, the kid would be way too shocked and scared to actually do anything. My wife was screaming in the bathroom, asking if I was okay. The police were there only five minutes later, since my wife had already been on the phone with them from the moment she entered the bathroom. Turns out the boy who we let into our house earlier that night unlocked our back door for his father to come in later to rob the place. I had been right when I said his brother looked way older, and that's because it wasn't his brother at all. It was really his dad who had sent him to our house to make it accessible for him later. The father was charged with home invasion and ended up getting 18 years in prison. Thank God he's still in there now. The boy, his son, was put into the care of his mother, who was actually in the middle of trying to get full custody of him due to his father's criminal background and inability to properly take care of him. Laura and I moved out of that house a month later and moved in with her parents for a while before finding another home. We just didn't feel safe in that house after. Our son is now 13 years old and thankfully was too young to remember what happened that night. Laura and I still remember though and we make sure to lock all our doors and windows every night before we go to sleep. What's Halloween without a little bit of fun in trying to scare your friends? When you're younger, it's all about candy and costumes, but when you grow out of that, it turns into a way to razz each other. At least, that's how I always saw it. When I was 14 years old, I wasn't quite ready to stop trick-or-treating. I had just gotten into high school and become a member of a cool group of friends. They made it clear pretty early on to me that we were too cool to act like kids anymore. I remember my mom asking me that year what I wanted to be for Halloween. She wasn't too happy when I told her I'd rather hang out with my friends. My dad, however, seemed to understand, and he gave me permission to hang out with them. He didn't tell my mom this, but he even told me I could stay out later than curfew, since it was Halloween. So there it was that me and my four best friends went walking around the neighborhood. A couple of the guys went to make fun of the kids trick-or-treating. I wasn't really into doing that though. I really wanted to be out there doing it with them. We went out past the houses and spent some time walking around the graveyard. That didn't last very long though. There were some even older teenagers than us there and they made it clear to us pretty early on that we were not welcome. We headed out, and when we got really bored, my friend Jeff had a great idea. There was an old school building on the edge of town that the kids in the neighborhood all considered to be haunted. We decided to go and sneak into the yard. The building itself was not huge, at least not compared to the current school building. When a new high school was built about 10 years before, the elementary school was moved into the old high school, and that left a building just empty. It then sat empty for years, with kids sneaking in all the time, and things like that. Of course, we all really believed it was haunted, just because kids always seem to think that abandoned buildings must have hauntings. Although the building wasn't huge, it was definitely scary. It was right out of town. It was really dark. It had boarded up and broken down windows, and plenty of no trespassing signs as well. Once we got into the yard, our courage failed. All of us pretended like we weren't scared of going in there. But we all knew we really were, and we knew each other knew it as well. We began accusing each other of being scaredy cats in order to hide our own fear. And so it was that we dared each other. Eventually, my friend Jeff was the one who took up that dare. We all went to the back of the building and found a broken back door. Jeff went inside. 
The deal was that he had to go to the second floor and wave to us from the window, so we knew he went further into the building. He went in. We watched and waited and watched and waited some more. I don't know how much time had passed, but pretty soon, it seemed like more than enough time had gone by for him to get upstairs. Still, we continued to wait, but he never showed up at the top floor. He didn't come back. About an hour and a half passed by before we began to get really worried. Had something happened to him? We couldn't call our parents or the police because we'd be getting in really big trouble. We had to suck up our fear and go into that school on our own. The four of us left and went into the school as a group. If we had been scared to go in alone before, we were even more scared now. The building just had a frightening atmosphere. There was trash and crap everywhere, tons of bottles and cigarette butts all over the place, and plenty of graffiti as well. It was real dark. We checked around and tried to find the stairs once we realized Jeff was not on the first floor. We found the steps and went up them. Jeff was laying down right at the top of the staircase, bruised, bloody, and unconscious. We didn't know what had happened, but we were scared out of our minds. We managed to grab him and bring him to at least enough that we could sort of carry him down the stairs and out of the building. We were of course frightened that whoever had done this to him was going to come back for us as well. Before we could get out once we were off the property though, we were about to call the police. Jeff had come too, and he forbade us from doing so. He just begged to come over to my house to clean up a bit. He didn't want to get in trouble, and he knew if he called the police, he would get bitched out by his parents. At first, he wouldn't even tell us what happened, but when he finally did, it really didn't answer any more questions than we already had. He was suddenly attacked from behind as he was making his way to the top of the stairs. The next thing he knew, we were trying to revive him. He never saw who attacked him. He refused to even get the authorities involved. He had severe bruising, but he just told his parents he had been attacked by a school bully. He wouldn't name the bully, of course. If anything, that old school building had a much scarier reputation afterward, and we were pretty sure that whoever attacked Jeff was still in the building while we were exploring it. We're pretty sure he stayed there for long afterwards. Before I say anything, the most important thing I should mention is that everything we did that night was supposed to just be a joke, all in good fun or whatever. I mean, there's no way we could have predicted what would happen. We never would have done it if we knew someone was going to get hurt, and we never meant to cause any harm. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. Me and my friends, who we'll call Ren and Oliver, were trying to figure out what we wanted to do for Halloween. We were all 15, and we figured that meant we were too old for trick-or-treating. We also didn't want to stay in all Halloween night, though. Halloween was on a Friday that year, which meant all of our curfews were later than during the week. We wanted to spend that extra time out during the most fun night of the year, doing something that was exciting. What we came up with was a bit cruel, but at the time, we thought it would be funny. If anything, it turned out to be scary for us and the person we decided to target. We lived in a relatively big city in the suburbs. Ren, Oliver, and I lived in the same neighborhood as each other, and a few blocks away from us lived a hoarder. Not the kind of hoarder who keeps everything confined to their house, either. This lady's whole property was full of junk, like at least six-foot-high piles of garbage right out on the lawn and in her backyard. It even piled up against the fence next to her neighbor's yard. We all knew who she was, but no one saw her very often. The news had tried to interview her a few times about the mess, but she always refused. We thought it was probably because she must have been embarrassed by what her house had become. Our plan went like this. We'd sneak around her house best as we could, knock on the doors and windows, shake a few doorknobs and make some ghost-like sounds whatever we could do to scare her a little. I know, you're probably thinking this was just mean. I wish I had some excuse for our actions, but I really don't. 
Anyway, once it was dark outside, I met up with Ren and Oliver, and in costume, we all headed for her house. A few people asked what we were dressed as, and the only answer we could come up with was bank robbers, since we were all dressed in black with stupid tights over our faces. I was mentally cringing at how ridiculous we must have looked. Looking back, I really should have been cringing at what we were about to do instead. We got to her house, and I was already nervous. For the sake of the story, I'll call this woman Emily. When we walked into her yard, we were met with a smell that can only be described as garbage and death combined. It was so bad that I begged the other guys for us to find something else to do. I thought I was going to puke at any second, right through the tights covering my face. I was gagging, but they just told me to suck it up. We tried looking through her window to see if she was inside, but there was no way we were going to be able to see anything. It was all just blocked up with garbage. On the inside, we could hear what sounded like the TV. We took that as proof she must be in there. Ren said the first thing we should do was each of us go in different windows around the house and begin knocking to try and spook her. I went around to the backyard, which was a big journey through garbage and rotting food. I was already regretting every moment we were there, but I didn't want to ask to leave again. I didn't want the guys to think I was just a loser chicken or whatever, so I got to the back sliding glass door that led to the kitchen and began knocking. As I knocked, I watched inside the house and saw movement coming from the room just outside my view. Making her way through the garbage and toward the door I was standing at was Emily. I hadn't actually seen her in years and gasped when she stumbled into view. She looked horrible, and when I say horrible, I don't mean ugly. She looked sickly, like physically ill. There were huge bags under her eyes, and she'd easily gained at least 150 pounds since the last time I saw her. Her clothes were extremely dirty, and she obviously hadn't showered in who knows how long. I stood there still for a moment, before realizing I needed to hide. Only my feet were caught in the trash that I was standing in, and no matter how hard I tried to move, there was no way I could get out of there before she saw me. Then I heard a knock at the front door. She must have too, since she turned in the other direction towards it. I was relieved. Oliver climbed over to me to ask what I was doing. When I told him I was stuck, we started to get a little worried. Ren came over to see what we were both doing as well. Both of them decided the funniest thing to do would be to leave me there and see if she caught me. Some friends they were, I guess. They pounded on the back door and ran out of view. As I watched Emily make her way towards me, climbing over the trash in her own home before she opened the sliding glass door, she grinned this awful grin when she saw me. I was struggling to get up and away from her. She giggled like a little girl kind of giggle that they do when they get a doll for Christmas or something. It was almost like this lady had superhuman strength, the way she just picked me up and pulled me out of that trash heap. She practically dragged me inside as I squirmed and begged her to let me go. I said that I was sorry, and I kept screaming for my friends to help me. I looked back at them as they watched her bring me in further and further into the house until I couldn't see them anymore. They looked scared for me too. All I could do was hope they would go and get some help. After dragging me through the filth in her house, she brought me to what I assumed had once been her living room and sat me down in her feces-covered sofa. The smell in her home was even worse than outside. I was gagging and gagging, and no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't hold it in. I vomited all over myself. The first thing she said to me was something that gave me chills. In a voice I can only describe as one someone uses when they talk to their own baby, she said, Oh, honey, let mommy clean that up for you. You spit up on yourself again. God, I was freaked out. She wandered away into another room and came out with the dirtiest towel I'd ever seen. As she got closer to me, I just started to cry. She brought the towel up to my face and wiped my mouth and clothes until she said it was clean. I could smell whatever was on that towel, and it only made me throw up once again. She didn't even seem to notice, or at least pretended not to, since this time she didn't clean me up at all. Instead, she sat beside me and grabbed me, placing me down on her lap as she cradled me back and forth. 
I shoved and pushed, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't escape her grasp. I kept begging her to let me go. After what felt like forever, she sat me back down to sit on the sofa. She got up and left the room once more. This time, she came back with the corpse of a dead cat. I wanted to cry when she sat it on my lap and told me it liked me and wanted to be petted. There was no way that was going to happen, though. After what felt like hours, but was probably only 30 minutes of being in that house, I heard sirens. The relief that came over me when I heard the police knocking on the door was insane. She answered, and when they asked if I was inside, she told them the only person in her house was her and her baby. They told her they needed to check to make sure, and after they rounded the pile of garbage blocking me from their view, it was obvious I was no baby at all. They told me to get up and come with them, but she didn't like that idea at all. She started screaming that they couldn't take her baby. She rushed in front of me and wouldn't let me go. They kept telling her to step aside, but she wouldn't do so. When one of them took a step closer, she charged forward. One of the officers yelled to taser her, and within seconds she was on the ground. Well, she was in the garbage, really, but for the purposes of this story, I'll just call it the ground. They arrested her and got me out of the house and into the hospital. I had to shower there since I was covered in God knows what bacteria and diseases that filled that house. Fortunately, I didn't get too sick. And aside from the mental trauma, that night ended up completely fine. Emily was put into some sort of group home or mental hospital or something, and her house was condemned and eventually torn down. I haven't heard much about her since, other than the fact she's still in there. I can't help but feel somewhat guilty for what happened that night. If we had just left her alone, she never would have been put into a position where she'd be tased or hurt in any way. I also can't help but feel, though, like we helped her by getting her out of that home and getting the mental help that she clearly needed. It's something that's been on my mind constantly. It's definitely the worst Halloween I ever had, and by far the scariest. Back in the second week of September, I took a short vacation to Hawaii with my boyfriend. The trip was very important to us because it was the only time both of us could arrange our work schedules to get off at the same time. Overall, the trip was incredibly fun and worthwhile. We made the most of it by visiting Pearl Harbor, the Stairway to Heaven, and the Kona Brewery. We even got some skydiving in, which is something I'm very proud of myself for experiencing. We stayed in an Airbnb on the top floor of a high-rise with a spectacular view of the city. We practically felt like we were living in our own private slice of sky. Well, perhaps we shouldn't have felt so untouchable. On the second or third day of the trip, there we were enjoying a relaxing morning. I was testing the mattress, the curtains were wide open, the sun was pouring in. Our sensual bliss was suddenly interrupted when my boyfriend looked towards the window. Babe, there's someone out there. Out where? I turned my head towards the window and felt my inside shrivel away. And there was a man with a dark tan standing outside on a platform, staring right in at us, not even pretending to not notice what we were doing. Had I ingested enough booze, I may have smiled and waved at him, but it was way too early in the morning for that. Instead, mortified, I hid under the covers while my boyfriend walked over and shut the curtains. Needless to say, it really killed the mood. Killed it so badly, in fact, it was dead and buried, about ten feet under, I'd say. For a few awful minutes of shock and embarrassment, a thousand questions raced through my mind. How long had he been out there? Had he recorded anything? Most important of all, what was he doing out there at all? My boyfriend and I eventually made peace with the idea that he was probably a window washer or something, and we had just been unlucky. Had this been a hotel, we probably could have called down to the front desk and complained, but it was an Airbnb rental, and technically a private residence. There was nothing we could do except to laugh and shrug it off, which is exactly what we ended up doing. We eventually left the room and went about our day. 
we had a pretty great time, and I can honestly say I didn't think twice about that guy all day long. We enjoyed the sights and each other's company, and when we got back to the room, we decided to pick up where we left off and had a good night's sleep. The following day, we spent some time on the beach, but instead of heading directly back to the room afterwards, we went up to the roof of our building to see the view and take some selfies. We took loads of pictures, watched planes take off and land from the airport in the distance, and overall enjoyed the sensation of being young and loved together in Hawaii. That's when yet again the moment was ruined. My boyfriend was out closer to the edge of the building, trying to get the best possible shot of the city skyline. I was sitting closer to the access door enjoying the sun and minding my own business when I heard the door swing open. I glanced over. It was the exact same guy who I'd seen outside the window the other day. He gave me a crooked smile, nodded and disappeared through the door and down the stairs, the door closing behind him. Before I could find my voice, my blood froze. Had this really just happened? How long had that guy been hiding up there on the roof with us? What was he even doing up here? He wasn't dressed as a maintenance guy. And what's more, his right foot had been encased in one of those medical boots, which implied he wasn't working in any capacity. I hadn't noticed it the other day when I made eye contact with him through the window. Part of me wanted to run after him and grab him by the throat, ask him what the heck he was doing stalking us like that. I'm a pretty small person though, and realistically acting like that would have probably ended worse for me than for him. I called my boyfriend over and gave him the rundown of what had just happened. He booked it over to the door and looked down the stairway, but of course the guy was already long gone. What do you think he was doing? We'd report him to the security guard downstairs in the lobby. He probably lived in the building. But then we would have to admit that we were up there on the roof too which technically we weren't supposed to be. Eventually, we just went back to the room without reporting him. We locked up our door tight, and the rest of our evening passed by without further incident. The next morning, around 6 a.m. or so, I woke up, rolled over in bed, and tried and failed to fall back asleep. After five minutes of laying there quietly, I began to hear a noise coming from the outside hallway. I sat up in bed and listened closer. It was a shuffling sound. I wondered if some building administrator was sliding something underneath the door. Then I saw the door handle jiggling. I was terrified. Like I said, this was not a hotel room. This was a private residence. I got out of bed without waking my boyfriend and crossed the living room to the front door. Outside, I suddenly heard the shuffling stop. Then came the sound of soft, uneven footsteps heading down the hallway. I braced myself and looked out the peephole, only to find nothing there. Had the person outside heard me coming? I double-checked the locks and headed back into the bedroom. The uneven footsteps unnerved me quite a bit. All I could picture was that prowler guy trying to get in and possibly get a closer look at my boyfriend and I in bed. Despite my unease, I fell back asleep after about 10 minutes. I woke up again at around 7.30. There was much more sunlight in the room now. My boyfriend was awake on his phone. I kissed him good morning and made to get out of bed. Hey, did you hear anything weird last night? He glanced over at me, and I saw the hesitation in his eyes. Not last night, but I woke up about 15 minutes ago. There was someone tapping on the window. My stomach sank. I stared at my boyfriend for a moment. Then we both climbed out of bed and threw back the curtains. I gasped and covered my mouth. There were two faint handprints pressed against the outside of the glass. It was right at about the spot where the curtains closed together, which implied to me he had tried to press himself against the window and peek in through the gap, possibly without any harness, just to get a look inside. That terrified me. My boyfriend and I immediately went downstairs and told security, who obviously didn't believe us until we asked them to take a look at the handprints themselves. We told them everything, about the man in the boot watching us and even us being out on the roof. After a 40-minute conversation with security, we left to get some breakfast. We never saw that guy again. I'm not sure if the building's security ever found him and put a stop to it, 
or if he just decided to stop on his own, but we were fortunate enough to be able to enjoy the rest of our trip without further incident. We left a shining review for the Airbnb too. While I'm still slightly creeped out, I'm glad I got to spend time in Hawaii with my loved one, and I don't regret the trip at all. Heck, this guy with the boot has given me a creepy story I can tell for years on end. Don't let one random guy dissuade you from vacationing somewhere you want, especially Hawaii. It's well worth the trip, and I would go there again in a heartbeat. I'd even stay in the same room. If there ever comes a day where I read online that a guy fell to his death outside that building though, I wouldn't say I'd be surprised. I wouldn't have to look at the picture to know who it might be. These are some strange experiences from a camping trip in northern Ontario I went on back when I was a little kid with my mom and dad. I want to preface this by saying that despite the things I've written about it, it was still a good experience. My parents parted amicably when I was very young, and I didn't actually live with my dad. I still got to see him often though, and these kinds of trips were a very fun experience. They were always a happy time, and we got along together very well. I don't want this story to overshadow that aspect. Anyway, on with the rest of it. My dad and stepmom rented a tiny cabin in northern Ontario one summer through a family friend. I don't know exactly where it was, but I'm certain it was well north of Midland. The cabin was on a lake, and the owner ferried us there on a tiny motorboat. This wasn't an island, mind you. I think there just weren't many roads to access this area. Some very strange things happened on this trip. And while there isn't a single cohesive timeline here, and I'm not an experienced writer, I'll try my best to document them. The owner had left a canoe at the cabin, and we took it out on a lot of trips on the lake, usually later in the day. I was obsessed with frogs and fish and wildlife as a kid, and this area was loaded with marshes. I loved these outings. I remember one of them in particular, it was almost sunset and we were hiking, heading back through one of the marshes. I heard a faint humming, similar to a transformer coming from the tree line on the shore. My dad and stepmom noticed it too. As it grew slowly louder, it stopped all of a sudden a few moments later. So did everything else though. The sounds of birds, frogs croaking, any other wildlife sounds had completely dropped off and were now silent. Nothing else strange happened on our way back, but needless to say, that experience was creepy as hell. The cabin was on a shoreline, but it wasn't a beach or anything close to one. It was actually a very steep and rocky shore around the entire area. Once you got to the waterline, there were a lot of mussels and crayfish that thrived there. My dad got the idea to catch some for cooking. Freshwater mussels taste fucking terrible, by the way. Don't try it. My dad isn't a woodsman by any means, but he is a very crafty and resourceful guy. We canoed to a sandy area close to the shore and waded out to catch mussels. On both sides of the water here, the shore was very steep rocks. There were wooded thick forests at the top. At some point during our escapade, I got a glimpse of something hiding among the trees on the opposite shore. I couldn't make it out very well but it almost had like the texture of a birch and was very lanky. I remember thinking that this definitely wasn't a person, but it was in the general shape of one, so I didn't really know what to make of it. Whatever this was was lethargically moving around, very slow, as if something was wrong with it. I waded over to my dad and told him to look over there. By that point though, whatever it was was already gone. I'm still not 100% sure if that isn't something I imagined. I was 9 or 10 at the time. I do remember seeing it appear again on the opposite shore on our way back. Now, this next incident I don't actually remember. Instead, my dad told me about it. On one of our canoeing outings, my dad and stepmom decided to visit the little peninsula on the other side of the lake, close to the marsh area. We all got there and dragged the canoe onto the little short line. 
as we walked in Lynn's single file. It wasn't a path. The trees weren't particularly dense, though. You could even see to the water when you looked back. I noticed the entire place was covered in mushrooms, and the live trees soon gave way to downed and dead trees further inland. This was quite unusual. It didn't look like there had been a forest fire or anything. They were all just mysteriously dead in this singular area. It started to smell really bad, too. Not wanting to venture any further inward, we all turned back. My dad didn't want to let on that he was quite nervous. I was young at the time, but he told me now that he was seriously freaked out. We stayed clear of the dead peninsula for the rest of the trip. My dad told me that something else happened to him during this trip. He went hiking by himself at some point, and when he was a little deeper into the woods, everything around him just stopped like that instant earlier. No sound whatsoever. No movement, no animals, no leaves in the wind. He could feel the presence of something dangerous around him. As soon as that presence left, a minute later everything returned. Nothing else like that event happened for the rest of his hike. This one isn't really scary, as much as it is weird, I guess. We spent most nights having fires outside, and one night my dad and I stayed up watching something on his tiny black TV. I'm not even sure how this place had power, since it wasn't easily accessible by road. Maybe it had a generator, or a small battery cell for all I know. There wasn't much other than a couple of lights, that TV, and a small water pump at the lake. Anyway, I was young, and watching X-Files was creepy as hell to me. During one of the episodes, we started to hear that humming coming from outside, just like when we were on the canoe earlier. We went outside with a flashlight to see if we could identify what this was coming from, but we couldn't find anything. We didn't actually want to go into the woods or take the canoe out in the darkness. It sounded like whatever this was was far away enough to not be a threat anyway. We just went back inside. Intermittently throughout the rest of the night though, this sound would get louder, sometimes quieting down. In the morning, our water wasn't working. My dad went to investigate the problem and found that apparently the pump cabling had been severely messed with. He was able to fix it easily enough, but this was clearly an act of malicious sabotage. This was probably the most unsettling one I remember, though. I would wake up earlier than everyone else in the morning, because I was pretty high up to go out and catch toads, frogs, and whatever I could. I even set a trap for a chipmunk one time, and successfully caught it. One morning, I had just woken up before sunrise, and I was still in bed. In the window next to my bed, I looked over and saw something that wasn't usually there. I could see what looked like half a face poking around the edge of the window and staring into the cabin. Whoever this was looked extremely sickly. Their eyes were so sunken back they almost looked like black holes. This person looked almost not human. I freaked out and hid under the covers. Eventually, I fell back asleep. When I woke up again, everyone else was also awake, and there was no sign of anything there. Honestly, everyone was so nonplussed about it that I was fooled into thinking this particular experience was just something I'd imagined after waking up. It had to be about a month ago. I met my dad while visiting. We were talking about this place again. He mentioned that he liked to usually go jogging early in the morning back then for exercise. It's a habit he still keeps up to this day. He decided to abstain for a couple of mornings at the cabin, though, because he felt there was something outside watching him. He couldn't really place what it was that was creeping him out. I remembered that incident with the figure at the window after our conversation. I wondered if that could have been the same thing that was making him feel that way. After I put all of these incidents together, it really made me think about that entire trip. That's one reason I decided to write this all down. I can't undeniably prove what's happened, but for what it's worth, you can decide for yourself. I don't tell stories like these regularly. I'm going to end this here now because it's gotten a lot longer than I expected, and it's a little bit disjointed. I was a little kid at the time all these things happened, 
and I don't remember every single detail or even the order the events took place in, really. I'm certain my dad and stepmom experienced stuff themselves. But if they did, they didn't tell me the entirety of it. I'm sure because they'd rather keep some things to themselves, or because they didn't want to scare me. 